All right, let's talk about case studies, which is a research method that involves in-depth description of a single person, generally, or in other cases, maybe a single event or a single group, like studying a cult. In general, case studies lean towards qualitative rather than quantitative, although as we'll see in a minute, they may be a mix of both. But you often find a lot of narrative description, like of an individual's life, in a case study. For example, there are a rare few people out there with a condition called akinetopsia, which is an inability to perceive visual motion. Like, you can't see things move, they just jump around, and things that may have looked far away a moment ago are suddenly close, or vice versa. So a case study with one of these patients might describe their day-to-day -day experience. Like when they're trying to pour a glass of water, the patient describes that they don't see the liquid getting higher and higher in the glass, it just suddenly is full and pouring over. Or maybe it includes a quote of what it's like for that person trying to cross a busy street or interact with people at a party when the person in front of you might suddenly appear across the room without smoothly moving away. So you can see why case studies are a common method to study something like traumatic brain injury, or people with rare syndromes or symptoms, or perhaps when trying out unusual experimental treatments with just a few people. Like, for example, some of the early results in the you know, early 2000s using brain-machine interfaces that allow a paralyzed person to control a computer, to control a robotic limb with their brain signals alone. We can only study a few people because there's only a few people that we're trying this out on so far. Uh, or you might be familiar with like a historical case study, um, one that's often mentioned in, in introductory psychology classes of a man named Phineas Gage. He worked on railroad construction back in the 1800s and had an accident where an iron rod, like an iron tamping rod, shot through his brain, a lot of his brain, hitting mostly the frontal lobe. He survived, but he was reported to have significant changes in his personality and his behavior, basically in who he was. He became more irresponsible, rude, made poor decisions, basically uh, lacking some of the functions that relate to self-control, inhibition, and planning that we now know are managed in part by the frontal lobes. So his story shows how a case study describing one person's experience can help us kind of formulate new ideas about brain function or human psychology. Now, neuropsychological case studies have helped us understand other stuff, like how memory works. Like with the famous case of a man with Korsakoff's syndrome. This is um, happens sometimes with people who have really extreme alcoholism. And in that case, it induced anterograde amnesia, the, the inability to lay down new explicit memories, uh, similar to what's portrayed in the, the famous movie Memento. Uh, or likewise, the incredibly well-researched case study of patient H.M., definitely the most famous, um, now identified as Henry Malason. He's a man who had parts of his brain removed to help his epilepsy, but then became unable to form new explicit memories. And tons and tons of research papers have come out on the case study of just this one patient. Uh, by the way, Oliver Sacks was a famous neurologist who wrote up a bunch of really interesting case studies about neuropsychological conditions. Um, so, for example, in books like The Man Who Mistook His Hat, or sorry, Mistook His Wife for a Hat, which references a case of visual agnosia, where a man uh, literally couldn't process things visually in a, in a way that recognized what they were. So he, he kind of at one point went to grab his, his hat, uh, but it was actually his wife that he grabbed, and it took him a moment to figure out what was going on. Anyway, Oliver Sacks writes about all sorts of case studies like this from his own career as a neurologist studying neuropsychological patients. Okay, so when you look in the peer-reviewed literature, you're sometimes going to see case studies like this, or, or case reports like this, um, written up in pretty short little articles describing maybe just an individual patient with something that's pretty uncommon. So for example, um, these cases here, uh, where someone recovering from damage to part of the brain starts to experience what's called supernumerary, so extra number, supernumerary phantom limbs, like a like an, a sort of almost imaginary extra limb that, that feels really like it's present on you, even though you, you look and it's not there visually. It just kind of has the feeling of a, of a limb being there, in this case of an extra limb that's not normally there. So for example, one woman reported being able to scratch real itches with this phantom extra arm, even though there's no actual you know arm there. And likewise, in a brain scanner, there was evidence the brain was treating it in some ways akin to real arm movement when the patient thought about moving this phantom limb. So things like this help us understand the normal functions of the brain, like how the brain normally keeps track of our actual limbs.
or it might help us understand how the brain establishes a sense of ownership over our body and our limbs, a sense of agency, or, or how the brain normally helps us inhibit and control our motor behaviors. Like with this case study of a 73-year-old man who had a cerebral infarct, which led to alien hand syndrome, a feeling like the hand wasn't part of his body, and, and he found it carrying out certain activities that he had no conscious intention to do. Here's a clip of someone experiencing something similar after a stroke. So you're going to hear a doctor in here asking about her recent experience where one of her arms was doing things without her control. And you'll even see a little of that. All right. So can you tell me, ma'am, what's been going on with this left hand? Yeah, there you are. The past couple of days, mm -hmm. um, my left hand has been doing involuntary movements that have been kind of surprising to the rest of my body. Mm -hmm. And tell me, I, I see it's moving now. It's Are you making that happen or is it doing it on its own? Doing it on its own. Okay. And can you lift that arm in the air for me? Yes, I can. Give it a try. Good. Great. Put it back down. Now, tell me, the other day, you told me that there was an interesting uh, thing that happened with your hair. Tell me about that. Yes, that was earlier today, actually. I was just laying in bed, and the nurses were coming around and asking how things were going. And things, I was saying, well, things are fine if I could just figure out who's pulling at my hair, because that hurts. And who was pulling at your hair? And they said, well, you, you're, you need to let go of your hair. So uh, my left hand was apparently pulling at my own head. And you didn't know that? And I didn't know that. I didn't realize it until, until my hand kind of fell flat against my head and then draped itself down the front of my face. Okay. And tell me, when, when you see this limb right here, yes. do you recognize that as yours? I do recognize it as mine. And has that been the case the whole time, or has been, there been some times when that was not the case? The, usually the only time I don't recognize it as mine, as mine is when it's laying across my body and it's making some kind of random movement, and I feel the movement. I think it's someone else making the movement. You think it's not your limb, but it's someone else's that's draped across your body making the movement. Yes, that's, that's correct. Okay, okay. Fine, and let me just have you do one more thing. With the right hand, um, can you show me how you would use a scissors? Good, perfect. Show me how you do it with the left hand then. Is it difficult to make the left hand do things like that? Yes. Okay. Fine. And then just show me with the left hand one more thing, how you would brush your teeth. Pretend you have a toothbrush in that left hand. Let go. So it looks like the hand is grabbed onto those wires and you're telling it to let go, is that right? Let go. Doing things you don't want it to do. Mm -hmm. And your right hand is, is making it stop. And do, your right hand and left hand, do they fight with each other sometimes like that? I, I notice that my left hand will grab hold of something and it has a hard time just releasing it. And you have to make your right hand come over and do that? Yeah, you have to make it either peel it out of my fingers or make my left hand let go of whatever it's... Okay. And just show me how you brush your teeth with your right hand. Fantastic. So that's called anarchic hand sign. Now, all these neuropsychology cases, they're helpful not just because they provide in-depth information about the person's lived experience, but also because it allows us to study things in a way that is impossible with a normal experimental design. After all, we can't take a bunch of participants and randomly assign some of them into a group that gets their brain damaged in a certain place to see what happens. We can't ethically damage someone's brain, but we can study when it happens to someone naturally or in an accident or 
uh, you know, through through that we can gain new information that might be valuable both to neuroscience understanding in general, but also to helping other patients in the future. Now, I want to go through one more example just to demonstrate an important point, which is that case studies are not just narrative. They can also involve collecting quantitative data and often comparing to other people, usually what we might call healthy controls, making it more in some ways like a natural experiment of sorts. So for example, this case study from 2010 deals with the topic that I've studied a bit, which is aphantasia, the, the lack of mental imagery. Basically, not having a mind's eye, not being able to visualize things, not being able to picture things in your head. So in this case, a guy who had been an architect before and used mental imagery all the time for his job, he suddenly woke up a few days after a heart surgery and no longer had that ability. He had acquired aphantasia, a lack of mental imagery. So in, in this article, in this case study, the authors describe his background, the, the cause of things, the surgery he had, and then the symptoms he had and his experience since, like what he's able to do and not able to do, how he describes it. So it has a lot of that narrative in-depth detail about his life, but it also has data like what we see in this table. So the patient is called MX here. Often we'll just use like a shorthand so we don't break the person's privacy. So MX is the patient and what you see next to him is data from a control group of people who are similar to him in a lot of ways, um, like age and other things, but they happen to have intact visual imagery. So in this case, in this, they might report on his results and also the control participants results from things like an intelligence test, like the WACE, or on a memory test, like the WMS, uh, so that they can establish kind of his intelligence, his memory, et cetera, including his immediate visual memory, that they're normal and unaffected, that they're similar to the control participants. But then they compare his scores on mental imagery stuff. So that'd be like questionnaires like the VVIQ um, and some other imagery tests. And, and they show that he performed way below the control participants on imagery stuff specifically. And then also they, they do things like compare his brain activity during relevant tasks to that of control participants doing the same thing. So this example, it makes it clear that a case study doesn't have to be just a narrative and qualitative description of someone's condition. It can also involve a lot of further testing, including comparisons with other people that's in some ways similar to kind of a quasi experiment or what we might call a natural experiment. Just not that it's a true experiment, but just in the sense that the unplanned accidents of nature in real life, they kind of happen to assign this person to the brain damage condition, so to speak. Now, I'll end by summing up some pros and cons of case studies as a research method. So on the pro side, it doesn't oversimplify the way that some experiments might, where each participant in a big experimental study is often only measured on one or two variables and everything else about their individual life is ignored as noise. So experiments might give us internal validity and control that lets us establish evidence of causation, and that's great, but they also tend to flatten things, so to speak, by focusing in on just one or two variables and ignoring everything else about the individual. Also, case studies provide a lot of context, which may be helpful. It may help us understand a phenomenon better. So it describes the situation and the person in detail. And sometimes that information really does matter. It can help us understand things or give us new hypotheses, for example. Lab studies, on the other hand, can sometimes be sort of artificial and, and out of context. Now, case studies can also help us find previously unknown effects or come up with new ideas. Like with the aphantasia example a minute ago, the lack of mental imagery, there was basically nothing systematic in the research literature about lack of mental imagery until this case study came out around 2010, aside from some you know informal work by historical figures like Galton. But now it's a very active area of study because of this one case study becoming well known. And case studies are one useful method of learning things that we can't learn because an experiment might be impossible or unethical. So things we can't kind of learn otherwise. Like I said, we can't randomly assign some people to have area X or area Y of their brain damaged. 
I mean, we, we can do things kind of like that using transcranial magnetic stimulation. We can temporarily shut down or increase the activation of some particular areas of the brain, but that only works for the outer few centimeters of cortex, not for other parts of the brain, which there are a lot of parts it can't get to. And, and maybe we could, I don't know, do, do actual experiments with random assignment of brain damage if we're using animal models. But that also sucks for the animals. And, and of course, animal models don't always generalize to humans perfectly. So case studies provide an additional tool in our toolkit for answering some of these challenging questions where we often can't do a proper experiment in humans. Meanwhile, there are downsides to case studies. Like, a single person may not be representative. We have no idea if the conclusions will generalize to other people, other brains, other situations. Also, the researcher may be biased. Think of it kind of like an unreliable narrator in film, uh, so to speak. So the researcher writing up the case study has a lot of freedom in how they describe things that they think are important or the things that fit with their expectations and their preconceptions. So confirmation bias can easily creep in in a case study. And of course, the whole thing is observational, not experimental. So just like we have to be careful interpreting correlational studies, we have to be careful here not to assume too much internal validity from a method like this. Like any other method, it has pros and cons, and it's, it's a valuable part of the researcher's toolkit, but often other methods may be more appropriate.